So this morning, Natuk is partnering with a new arm, um, if you will, of the college. It's the Alma Francois Institute for Research and Debate. This is a recent um, introduction at the institution. My name is Akins Vidal, I'm the coordinator of that institute. And our primary objective, or one of our primary objectives, is to act as a facilitator for the educational development of working class people, be they trade unionists or credit union members, unemployed, employed, unionized, non-unionized. Non-unionized is, is irrelevant. So our main focus is research and development and education of all of our people. And I, I want to make the point, um, which is why we chose social protection, and I don't want to get in too much to the deputy um, director's contribution. One of these things, we've just come off a few days celebrating or commemorating emancipation, I think commemorating is the correct or better word to use. And when we read about that period of enslavement, an important observation that is made is that the enslaved paid very close attention to their condition at all times. They were aware of what pieces of legislation were being passed in the British Parliament, and they mobilized and organized around those things constantly. And it is odd that in a period where we have access to so much information at the tips of our fingers, that as workers, we are less aware, less concerned about our own business. And we must know that these battles that we're engaged in require us to know about our own business because someone else is going to do it for us. Someone else is going to teach our children that trade unions are a waste of time. And if you're not in a position to defend the organization because you don't know the history of the organization, then your children is going to be that other person who seems to have information at their fingertips. Because if you look around the room, um, and when we go to a lot of these sessions, the age kind of leans on the higher up side, generally. Because we're not, we're not attracting the younger people in the workplace into the trade unions. And we have to work on that and we have to figure out why. And sessions like these will hopefully help us, help us to get there as we begin to understand what is the rule and purpose of the trade union beyond simply negotiating wages and salaries. That is an important aspect. That's an important aspect. But too much more has to be done in terms of the development of the members of the union. So comrades, the exercise today, our symposium, charting a course for universal social protection in Trinidad and Tobago. We see social protection as a critical function of the trade union movement. So you have to come out of your comfort zone sometime because you have to protect not just the unionized workers, but the non-unionized workers. You have to also stand up for the unemployed workers, who are also workers. And all of this has to be, has to be our battle. So we're going to have some important presentations. And we will have Dr. Henry, who is the director at the college, who will address social protection and employment protection. We'll have Mr. Alva Allen, who's an adjunct lecturer here at the college, and he will discuss social security, focusing specifically on the question of pensions. And if you're on a pension committee, you know that this is a very important discussion to be had in this moment in time. Gender equity is particularly important, but we felt that rather than discuss it in abstraction, we would ask Ms. Ida LeBlanc from the National Union of Domestic Employees to speak specifically to the challenges faced by domestic workers in this country, because the majority of domestic workers are in fact women. And then we will have his honor, Mr. Gregory Rousseau, um, industrial court judge, to discuss the principles and practices of good industrial relations associated with retrenchment. So all of these topics, comrades, have been chosen because these are issues that we are grappling with now. These are current issues. These are important issues that we must be able to articulate. And I know every corner that you go in, somebody is, at some point you have to defend your union. You have to defend why you're in this. It's a constant battle. And so these exercises help us to have the kind of ammunition necessary for us to have conversations 
that leads somewhere and don't degenerate into a consultant or a Yeah, You have to have the information. So with that, I want to introduce our first speaker to give his opening comments, uh, Mr. Sheldon Salino, Director, Deputy Director, Academic Affairs, Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. Please welcome him to the So I'm pleased to welcome you all here to this joint initiative between Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies and the National Trade Union Center Network, which takes the form of the panel discussion with the team charting the course for universal social protection in Trinidad and Tobago. The college, as you may or may not be aware, is the only academic institution in the country which focuses on delivering quality education, training, and development to the labor and cooperative movements. And I believe that this partnership and discussion is part of our mandate to inform and lead positive actions for the empowerment of working people and by extension all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. This initiative, as Akins would have indicated, is executed under the auspices of the recently relaunched or reactivated in mid 2018 the Center for Electri Intellectual Debate, which is now called the Elma Francois Institute and Debate. And to date, in that short space of time, the Institute has actually hosted three events starting in June during the Labor Month celebrations. The rationale for today's event is captured in the note that I said Akin would have developed and as he is the lead individual for the Alma Francois Institute as well, who is charged with operationalizing the Institute. So in summary, from the note, our country continues to grapple with the challenges of an energy-based economy. More and more pressure is being placed on those institutes, institutions which attend to the needs of most of the vulnerable in our society. The fiscal adjustments, which are characteristic of the current global economic climate, calls for heightened vigilance on the part of such institutions to ensure that the burden of adjustment is not distributed inequitably to the detriment of their stakeholders. One such organization is the trade union movement, and another which I must also add because of my background is the cooperative movement. With increased calls for greater productivity in the midst of slow growth of the economic pie, trade unions are faced with the precarious task of balancing the calls for greater output by employers from its members while debts for work already done remain unpaid. Moreover, the non-unionized worker, as in the case with the unemployed worker, relies heavily on the gains and protections achieved by the unionized clusters, as these set an informal minimum standard to which employers generally adhere. It must also be noted that in the Caribbean tradition of the trade unions, the work is not confined to industrial relation issues, but encompasses every aspect of the lives of workers everywhere, specifically the social, cultural, and economic aspects. This fact makes a conversation with the trade union movement inevitably as one seeks to address the question of social protection in TNT. This rationale lays for, for today's presentation by our panelists, so it lays the foundations for the presentation by our panelists today. The sub-themes which will be addressed by our panelists are employment protection, social security or pensions, gender equity, and specifically, as we saw Ms. Laplant entering the room while Akins was speaking, I'm sure she will share with you from the gender perspective the roles that cooperatives and the cooperative that they have coming out of their trade union, how that can contribute to enhancing the social protection, protection mechanisms for their members. And the final area would be retrenchment as well. As I indicated, I also believe the cooperatives, which share a similar philosophy, background, and purpose to trade unions, also have a role to play, and the development of a deeper relationship between the two sectors can also serve to inform any strategy 
and part on the issue of social protection. Before I close off, it would be, if I don't do this, it would be very unfortunate. We have with us today, I'm thinking probably more than 100 trade unionists in our auditorium. And we are currently accepting applications for various programs. We have our certificate in industrial relations, and this is specific to you. We have our diploma in industrial relations, associate of arts degree, and bachelor's program. And I'm sure just a nod from the director, he will waive all application fees for today. <laughs> for anyone who signs an application before the leave here today. So I would urge you during the break, during the lunch time, visit our front counter, our admissions desk, sign up, discuss with Atkins, who is very familiar with the programs, myself, and probably some of our labor studies lecturers, Mr. Allen, who is a key lecturer in the labor studies program. Discuss with them, have a conversation on how we can contribute to enhancing your academic areas or your area of study with respect to industrial relations. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. And I'm sure that we will have a productive day that will serve as a foundation for further development in this year. Thank you very much. Good morning, comrades. All protocols observe. And allow me just to add to the statement that was made for unknown to several people in NATO. We have been engaging Cipriani Labor College in a lot of discussions as it relates to how the college can be relevant to the need of the present day trade unionists. And one of the concepts that we came up with was the question of the moot court. And it is going to be a trial basis, but the whole intent and purpose and it is due to start in September, is to empower representatives to make the kind of representation at the industrial court that is necessary for the trade union movement. And I want to um, express Natuk's appreciation and thanks to the director and his team, and also um, Sister Joy Bartlett, who was part of the team along with me who was engaging in the college <coughs> in respect of developing a program for the National Trade Union Center. And as I say that, I will want to raise some fundamental issues. Issues that I think it is important from my perspective and my views for the trade union movement. And why, yes, the question of grievance handling, why the question of going to the industrial court is important. If we as trade unionists implant in our minds that that is what the trade union movement is all about, I think, I think that we'll be making a fundamental mistake as trade unionists and as a movement. From where I sit, I see the trade union movement as a bigger, wider body. I see the responsibility as not only limited to that confinement, because if you do that, in my view, you are playing right into the stereotype in terms of what is the role of the trade union movement. And the question of growing the trade union movement as a community-based voice is So I am saying that we must start in a narrative that takes into account the whole question of the macro social, economic, psychological, physiological, and moral perspective of our society. That is our role. And I say that against the backdrop and I reason that because it's critical as far as I am concerned. We just had a selection of a commissioner of police. What is the role of the trade union movement in this, you may ask. 
but we don't see it in the context But that is our role, but that is our role because the commission of police dictates laws and carries laws that affect us. And therefore, the question is, was the process right or wrong? Where was the voice of the trade union movement in the context of a flawed system? And yet still we take somebody from that system that is flawed and make that person a commissioner of police. Don't we have a say in that as a society? Don't we have a say in that as a people? Don't we have a say in that as the trade union movement? And I am arguing that we have a say in that because that impacts on us and therefore this question of you cannot question the august body of parliament is something that we have to do away with. And if we do not start to inject the kinds of representation that goes beyond the confines of just collective agreements or grievances, we're going to get lost in the process. I am saying that against the backdrop. That, one, that when one takes into consideration this artificial intelligence and the implication for the working class, which is a whole new dimension, which is a whole new kind of discussion, which is a whole new kind of approach to trade unionism, all right, we have to start to engage in those kinds of discussions. And I'm saying that the role of Cyprian in the Labour College, and I've had that discussion with the director and his team, has to be part of that. It cannot be just we train people and give them a degree. It has to be and it must be we broaden the thinking of representatives. We make them critical in their analysis in terms of what is happening. The whole question, and I will raise something, the whole question of a universal basic income is something that I support. Right? It is not a narrative in Trinidad and Tobago yet, but it is something that is being discussed worldwide within the trade union federations and, and it's something that we're supposed to look at. I think it is important. And next question of who controls the ideas? Because people do not understand that. Right? It's who controls the ideas, dictates what happens within a society. And therefore, do we have a responsibility as a trade union movement to insist that we are part of the decision-making process as it relates to formulating programs, laws, or whatever it is that affects and impact on the trade union movement, on the working class, the society. Those are things, in my view, that is critical. Those are things that I think that the Supreme Labour College has a responsibility all right, to get themselves involved in. And those are the kinds of engagement that we are having with Cipriani Labour College to make Cipriani Labour College relevant in the context of what is happening in the wider society. Having said that, having said that, I would like to raise one or two issues before I close off from my perspective. I see the trade union movement in the context of a language. And a language is universal. And in other words, who speaks the language determines what happened. So we as a trade union movement must be able to form our own agenda in the context of what we want as the trade union movement and as the working class and the representative of the working class as opposed to the agenda that is being set up by the news media, the 1%. People make noise about, but there's a 1% in Trinidad and Tobago. And the political elites, the financiers, the business elites who dictate what happens, what laws are passed. We have no say, and then therefore, we have a responsibility to take our representation beyond the narrow confines, as I said before, of just collective bargaining, grievances of the industrial court. The society, right, is broader and wider than that narrow confine. And if we do not understand that as trade unionists, we're going to be here talking over and over and over the same thing. You understand? Without getting any resolutions to our, to our, to our issues. E.g., outstanding negotiations. We have raised that more than a year now. In, in tap, and we have to make a decision just now. 
right? And four meetings didn't come up because the Minister of Finance chose not to come to the meeting. Is that fair to us? We are talking about the Port Authority, and we raised that here, who have a settlement of 12%, and the government, for some reason, do not want to implement it, and they tell the Port to find the money. When they know that the Port do not have the money, right? The IMA, the Institute of Marine Affairs, six years, the CPO has not yet given directives as it relates to the IMA negotiations. I could talk about the daily rated workers who pension plan is still outstanding. All those are issues that we have been raising in intact. And to date, I cannot say that we have any positive response. As a matter of fact, we were to get a response within two weeks' time, time which would have end, ended um, about two weeks ago. And to date, we are advised by the chairperson, we are still wait, um, waiting on the Minister of Finance. And then, and that wants us to discuss productivity in a society. How can we discuss productivity in a society when workers' wages are being depressed? When workers haven't gotten wage increases since 2007 in some instances? What kind of madness is that? If we're talking about productivity, productivity and wages go hand in hand. Right? And, and then, therefore, the government is missing and the business community because the blame for productivity is placed at the doorsteps of the trade union movement and workers because we are lazy. We are lazy. But we see the banks declaring billions of dollars in our profits. How is profit generated? That's the next conversation for another time. And I'm just putting those things out on the market. Having said that, there is this guy that I read. Colonel West, black intellectual, and he made a profound statement, and I want to read it. If this organized society cannot generate concepts of its alternative future or act on them, organization is power, a power essential to a vigorous democracy. This organization is to surrender to drift, accident, and to fate. And I'm saying, I want to make that point here. It doesn't only apply to society, it applies to the trade union movement. It applies to the trade union movement. And therefore, if we do not organize ourselves, if we do not agree to disagree, if we do not understand that people have a right to disagree, and you have a right to respect one another if we have to move forward. We're going to find ourselves like in this organized society where nothing can happen. That is fundamental now as we move forward in this new dispensation. I'm going to Singapore. We are going to see a port that is operating without human beings. That's a reality, you know. And we don't pay attention to that because that is not important. And we don't understand how that impacts on us as workers and as people in Trinidad and Tobago. And as a community, we don't understand that. And if robots are taking over our jobs, what do we do in the context of workers who will be displaced? What do we do in terms of how that impacts on society? What do we say in terms of how that impacts on crime? Who will play those displaced workers and them? All right? And why that has been allowed to happen? And there is no alternative narrative or discussion in terms of when they displace these groups of people. What do we do in terms of those people? And that is why I'm saying the universal wage is a critical discussion that the trade union movement must have. I will want to end by saying that, you know, we in the trade union movement, we must be more self-critical of ourselves and our position and vantage point. We must focus on principles and realities. All right? We must look at the, not the immediate interests, but the bigger picture. The movement must be regulated by broad and universal ideas of democracy, 
and decency, fairness and dignity, justice and freedom for all. I am asking, do we pursue any sense of meaning beyond money-making and profit-taking? Isn't that what we have to do as a trade unionist? And I always raise this question. If we're talking about the independence of the trade union movement, in my view, that is my view, do we discuss how the trade union movement become independent by getting themselves involved, involved with co cooperatives, by running businesses, by owning our own newspaper, by owning our own TV station so that we can carry we can carry our views to our members. People don't talk about that. Some people say it's a conflict of interest. I don't agree with that. Because we always talk about when labor hold the reins of power. What do we mean by that? Then? What do we mean by that? And don't let nobody fool you and then let you believe that the institution and the right to making profits and our money is assigned and prescribed for one group of people. And we as the workers are only there to do what? Labor and give our labor right for some porridge. Is that what we want? And those are some of the questions that I want to place on the table. And I want to end again and I want to make the point that those who lose sight of the role of the trade union movement those who believe that the trade union movement confined is just grievance handling or the industrial court, right, the collective bargaining, and doesn't go out of the broader aspects of all the economic, political, and other issues, social, ethical, and other issues that impact on us as trade unionists, as workers, as a community, as a society. We're not understanding what is our role as trade unionists because we are playing and dancing to the truth that was prescribed for us that we limit ourselves to one little area and the bigger area we don't get ourselves involved and I'm saying finally this is the last final the last last one the time has come for us as trade unionists for us as the working class to demand from the politician what we want. It cannot be, and it must not be, that democracy, <laughs> democracy is every five years, you stain your finger, and the next day they forget what to When you call them, they even answer you. But when it's election time, they, they're hugging up your baby, they're playing with your dog, and all that. Right. Then they start to finish. We have to start to demand. as a trade unionist, as workers and them, when they come to us, we have to put our agenda. This is what we want. And if you're not going to give us that, we're not going to support you. This has nothing to do with political parties. It's beyond the political divide. This has to do about the survival of the trade union movement and the workers and society and the communities. I thank you. Let's talk a little bit about uh, social protection. We are in a very, um, we are in very turbulent times in the development of society. And what we find is that the people who suffer most are working people. People who are not necessarily property and people who depend on their own labor for their sustenance. And indeed, social protection is one of the core strategic objectives of the International Labour Organization. So what I'd like to do is just briefly introduce the concept of social security and then I want to focus specifically on, um, on protecting employment. What are some of the basics of social security? First, social security is a human right and I don't think we see it like that. Um, it is also an approach to a set of policies so every human being is supposed to have the right to a sense of security, but social security also refers to a set of policies that a society can develop, and as Michael and Atkins and Sheldon talked about, you have a responsibility as a, as a labor movement to direct the scoping 
and the organizing of social security. So social security, uh, sorry, social protection is designed to reduce risks uh, faced especially by the vulnerable in the society. And we talk about who are some of the vulnerable. Both people. Sorry. Yeah, working people, the poor, uh, the unemployed, the farmers, people in rural areas, dispossessed women. Um, it also includes interventions by government, by the private sector, and most importantly, it is supposed to include interventions and thinking by the labor movement. And a social protection system, therefore, is a set of government policies, could be a set of government policies designed to give specific social groups uh, some protection. And these can include children, uh, unwed mothers, disabled, and so on. So when we speak about social protection, we're talking about a, a really big idea. There are many forms of social protection, and by the way, if you give us, if you've registered, and you can probably just share the presentation, and there are some details that in the interest of time I don't want to go into. But social protection can come in the form of cash in kind uh, transfers, and are designed to help people maintain a minimum standard of living, and social protection is normally specific to a particular country. Therefore, countries are supposed to develop what you call social protection flows. Michael refers to um, a universal wage. A universal wage is part of a social protection flow in which you guarantee that no citizen, no resident in the country will go below that flow. So, social protection flows are a set of nationally defined basic social security guarantees which secure protection aimed at preventing or alleviating poverty, vulnerability, and social inclusion. And it's not just poverty and vulnerability, but an important part of the concept is social exclusion. That it's not just that people can eat and be sheltered, but people need to have a sense that their dignity is protected. So I won't go into those details, as I said, you can, um, you can look at those in the... Um... So what are the challenges to social protection? The first is international economic processes. Michael referred to one in specific when he talked about the, um, the robotization of the port in Singapore. There are many different forms of, um, of international economic processes which are placing pressures on working people. And then we also have the change in workplace. The nature of the workplace is changing and changing rapidly. And as trade unionists, you need to be thinking about how this change in workplace is affecting your membership, how the change in workplace is affecting the working people. But the worker is also changing. The expectations of the worker I remember that I always like to tell this story as a young man joining the public service some many years ago, 40 years ago, and speaking to one of easily one of the one of the most inspiring public officers I ever met, the late um, Ambassador James O'Neill Lewis, Dr. James O'Neill Lewis. And in fact, a really, very dignified human being. And I remember when I was doing my final exam for my PhD, he was the ambassador in Washington. And he didn't need to, but he accompanied me to the, to, to the, um, to the oral exam. Sat in the oral exam and waited while I waited for the results. And I, I'm trying to convey to you um, a sense of the dignity of this human being that not, notwithstanding wherever he reached in life, that he never lost touch of a sense of dignity. And while we were waiting outside, I guess the colony, he told me a story of his father's ambition for him, growing up in a colonial society. 
that. And Dr. Lewis said that his father's ambition for him was that he would have been a second class postal clerk. That was the designation. And that was his father's ambition for this young man. And why? Because as a black man in a colonial society, a second class postal clerk was the minimum level in the public service at which you could handle cash. And for him, the sense of achieving as a black man was that you were able to handle cash. Happily, he was not limited by his father's ambitions for him, which were in a sense framed, as, as Michael said, by the ideas that were prevalent in the society as to what a non-white person in Trinidad and Tobago in the 1950s could aspire to. If I were to tell one of my children that my ambition for them is anything other than what they want, but I don't need to tell you what they want. <laughs> and then the, the fourth challenge to social protection is what we call non-standard employment, and that is what we form most of the basis of my discussion. What's the current state? The major social protection conventions, I know social protection conventions, have not been ratified in each country in the Caribbean. So that's maybe one of the one of the areas that uh, the NATO and the Trade Union Conventions have. Getting the social protection conventions, which are the minimum international standards that, um, that, that we judge social protection on. And then the other thing that we haven't done is that we haven't really done any sense of um, to determine what are the social protection mechanisms in place in the country and therefore what are the needs of the country and what are the gaps that we have to fill. So two immediate pieces of work jump out at us. One is that we need to advocate for the ratification of the social protection conventions and two, we need to conduct a gap analysis, understand what is the nature of the gap between the provisions that have been made for social protection and the needs for social protection. And I'm happy to see Shangati shaking her head and we'll be happy to partner with both the Ministry and NATO to make sure that these important pieces of work are done. Jobs, jobs, jobs. In the Caribbean, a job is one step, is often one step between many workers and poverty or vulnerability to poverty. In the Caribbean, most workers live from paycheck to paycheck. Many young people, my own children, we have to give up the idea of owning their own home. Yes? Because of the nature of the, of the economic structures. So when we think of employment, when we think of jobs, we really have to understand the role of employment in ensuring levels of social protection that are, ad that are adequate. And we need to bear in mind that social, we don't do social protection for social protection sake. But if people are dispossessed, if people are stressed, if people are vulnerable, if people are marginalized, the knock-on effect of those things in terms of other kinds of social dysfunction, such as crime, etc., cannot be underestimated. So there are some of us who may be living a good life and feel because we're behind the walls of a gated community, we're all right. But you can't live 24 hours a day in the gifted cage of a gated community. So we need to understand the, the broader implications of our responsibilities um, in ensuring that people have a sense of, um, of dignity. So employment in the Caribbean. What is the nature of employment in the Caribbean? And what is the context of employment? Our problem is that size and openness limits our ability as countries to pursue autonomous policies that favors social distribution 
and wage led group. And I just want to tell you what a little bit about wage led group. One of the things that you often hear, especially from the private sector and sometimes from the government, is that wages are a cost and therefore wages need to be controlled. And there's always talk about wage control. Now I would grant you that there needs to be some relationship between wages and productivity and output. But what has happened is that that false narrative has been used to drive a process of what we call profit-led growth, or what Ronald Reagan would have called trickle-down economics. And if the if they, they private companies do well, well then workers will get a piece. Not recognizing, and um, Comrade Ali said, touched on it tangentially when he talked, for example, of the, the, the profits of banks, that wages create demand, and demand creates business. So it is almost like shooting yourself in the foot if you focus on profit-led growth as an alternative or as an exclusive alternative to wage-led growth and not understand how paying a decent wage, providing more and better jobs, creates the basis by which you can get more economic growth. Now, our challenge is because of our small size and our openness and our dependence on, um, on Multi, multinational corporations and so on. Our space for autonomy is somewhat circumscribed, but that doesn't mean that we don't try. What it, what it tells us is that the need for creativity is even greater. The need for understanding in common what we have and bringing to bear all our resources is, is even greater. So you have small open economies, what we have in, in the Caribbean, the small economies following the trend of profit-led growth. And countries advertise, tend to advertise themselves to foreign investors as a low-wage location. We identify low wages as a source of competitiveness. At the level of the, of, of the enterprise, there's almost like a, there's a, a race to the bottom. And that race to the bottom can take the form of um, anti-union practices as well as frustrating the desires of workers to exercise their rights. And we see two firms compromising on issues such as health and safety, work-life balance, and other conditions of work. So it's, that gives us a, a kind of a general context of, um, of some of the challenges we face with uh, social protection. We also have the implications of our regional situation with the um, implications of the CSM. And we are seeing that there are regional trends which are affecting the workplace and employment relationship. And various protocols of the CSM, particularly free movement of people, free trade in services, and freedom of establishment, have created new businesses and new forms of businesses and new challenges that need to be taken into account as we seek to protect the interests of working people. In some work that I have identified two, two major types of employers, and if people could, um, could quarrel and decide. There, there are some what I call the traditional forms of enterprises. And these are companies in what we can call the export enclave in Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Guyana, Suriname, uh, mainly where you have the big companies normally in things like mining and so on. So what you have is that these, these companies bring a certain form of organization into the jurisdictions. Then you have large local companies, most of which started off mainly as trading companies, but have evolved into manufacturing and service activities, and you can identify these. And then you have small family-owned, family and privately-owned companies. And these were the traditional companies, I would call them, that um, in the private sector. And of course, you have the, the government, um, the, the public service. 
as employers. But we're seeing some trends that are putting different kinds of pressure on the whole employment environment. The first I want to identify are the international companies, mainly in the fast food industry. Then we have international companies, maybe, maybe service and technology companies that use uh, individual countries as a base to serve clients. Very important, you have government special purpose companies that are causing a distortion in the, in the employment environment. And you have small businesses owned by recently arrived um, residents and businesses heavily dependent on migrant workers. And as we observe there, are, yes, trade unions have a primary responsibility to protect their members, but trade unions as other um, organizations in civil society also have a responsibility to protect all working people. And many of these, especially these new forms of enterprises, you have large numbers of workers that are falling outside of the traditional, um, the traditional uh, organized labor arrangement. A little bit about non-standard forms of employment. The classical stereotype of a full-time permanent job with fixed hours, defined benefit pension, on completion of a largely secure uh, career path with a single employer is increasingly an infrequent uh, reality. Not many people can look forward to that. And it's a consideration again that we have to bear in mind as we develop, um, as we think about social protection. And non-standard employment is going to become more and more the norm in the Caribbean. And we have to be thinking, you have to be thinking, of how you organize workers who are engaged in non-standard forms of employment. And I have identified here some of the characteristics or some of the drivers of non-standard form of employment. Non-standard employment affects employment security. There is a greater incidence of temporary employment. It affects earnings. Research shows that workers in non-standard employment face substandard, substantial penalties as much as 30%. Um, and it should be noted that for some sectors, like for example information technology and, and, and sectors like that, there's actually a premium on non-standard employment. But in most cases, um, there is a, a wage penalty. Workers, non, workers in non-standard arrangements tend to have limited control over when they work and how many hours they work. And I'm going to exercise a little bit of director's privilege and take a little extra time. So tell that fella stop signaling me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it has implications for occupational self health and safety. Workers in non-standard employment are at increased risk due to issues such as poor induction, training and supervision, and communication breakdown. Comrades, this tells us, um, and, and, and it goes back to the point of how big your sense of what is required to protect the interests of our uh, of business is. And it cannot just be, as was stated earlier, it cannot just be about um, every three years you do a collective, uh, a collective labor agreement. You know, let, let me throw it back at my brother Michael. He talked about the politicians um, coming every five years for your vote. But I submit to you that some trade unions are like that. Just every three years, they come to mobilize you to protest for a collective labor agreement. Six or one and a half a dozen the other way. Implications on social security workers in NSE 
are sometimes excluded from social security coverage, sometimes even by law. Um, I, I, I need to find out whether this happens for us. Um, but most often they include it simply because they don't make the, the thresholds for hours worked and so on. Training, they get less training and representation and other fundamental rights of work, they are excluded from that. There are some advantages and there are some disadvantages um, <coughs> in non standard employment, but as you will see from this table, the advantages are far outweighed by the disadvantages if we do not take into consideration and if, and if we are not careful to create systems that will provide protection for workers. The um, ITUC position on jobs is this. There is a global job crisis. There are not enough jobs. There are not enough jobs for the next generation. And there is an international trend of weakening and dismantling of labor laws. There is wage dispute. Workers are worried about rising inequality, family incomes are in crisis, and minimum wages are insufficient to lead a decent life. And then there is failure on the part of governments with, in terms of government's performance in addressing these crises. So we need to protect. So we need to understand that in times of economic stress, there's stress on jobs. Um, early school leavers are particularly at risk. Women entering the labor force continue to be undervalued. And while MS, MSMEs are some of the most important uh, generators of jobs, they tend to get the least attention in terms of government policy. What we know is that job creation results in more robust and inclusive poverty reducing growth. And there is proof that developing and, emergency and emerging countries, which in the last 20 years invested more in creating quality jobs, grew their economies grew faster, and they experienced lower levels of income equality. So, a foreign direct investment approach that seeks to portray the jurisdiction as low wage or when wages are controlled or when there are compromises on labor standards is in a sense, as I said, shooting yourself in the foot. Job-centered economic growth creates a virtuous cycle uh, that is good for the economy and protecting safety and health reduces losses to the economy. I will end here. Just to say, as I said, I will share this slide because I have several more slides. And you know, he's, he's signaling me here, and I think I will have to discipline him. But he took a lot of my time to <laughs> yeah. But the, the point is that in protecting workers, in, in, in addressing social protection, employment and jobs is a critical element of, of, of that equation. And we cannot think of employment and jobs in the traditional way. We need to understand what are the stresses that are being placed on employment, on employment opportunities, on the nature of jobs, on the quality of jobs, and on the persons of the worker. And we need to address those in a coherent, cogent and, um, manner, in a comprehensive manner. And those things cannot be done simply by unions or by governments. These things have to be done in the context of comprehensive partnerships. Thank you. Good day to everyone. And as I usually say, all protocols are observed. That is something I don't really like to say. <laughs> but if I will get right into my presentation, telling you about what's happening with the domestic workers and also low-income workers here in Trinidad and Tobago. 
First, um, let me say a little background on our union. In a, the, the president of our union, past president, and who was the founder of our union, deceased Clotel Walcott. When she died, Professor Rhoda Reddock gave the eulogy, and it was a tribute to Clotel Walcott. And in her tribute to Clotel, she began by saying, in our lifetime, we sometimes have the privilege to live and walk with people of great vision and genius. Sometimes we recognize that greatness. Sometimes we don't. And even when we do, it often takes their passing for us to realize the fullness of their contributions. Clotel Walcott was one such person. Even though she was recognized many times over during her lifetime, how much more do we recognize her greatness now that she is no longer here with us? Reda continues, Clotel was an extraordinary working class woman who attempted to bring before the public the hardships and experiences of working women, both in their paid work and their own wage work, which she knew firsthand and engaged in a continuous struggle to improve their working and living conditions. Clotel described herself as a grassroots woman and became in many ways the voice of the voices never waiting for an invitation to attend an event or meeting related to workers or women's rights. That is a woman, together with veteran trade unionists, deceased also, James Lynch, in 1974 started the National Union of Domestic Employees, nude as a branch of the ship, the Union of Shipbuilders and Ship Repairers, USSR, and in 1982, Clotel, together, together with Shalisha Hossein, Marino, Paul Walcott, and others, formed the executive and registered new as a trade union in December 1982, under the Trade Union Act, to organize into the union domestic workers who work as cleaners, cooks, housekeepers, caregivers, handymen, drivers, gardeners who work in and around private residences. Now a lot of men in this country who work in and around their home, they work as gardeners, handymen. They do not recognize themselves as domestic workers. Sometimes they may come to me and I'm telling, when they tell me what are the, the job that they're doing, I say, oh, you're a domestic worker. No, 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 I'm not a domestic worker. I'm a handyman. You know what, anybody, according to the Industrial Relations Act, anybody who works in and around the household and paid by the householder is not a worker. And that is our burning issue since we began this union and to date, and as I told you, 1974, we're in 2018, to date, government refused to recognize domestic as workers. Now, when the workers in the informal sector keep coming to us for help, those who were drivers, janitors, bartenders, loaders, waitresses, a lot of people from the mining industry, who is particularly men, come to us. And their complaints are no different to domestic workers. The only difference is that they are considered workers and the union can seek recourse on their behalf in matters of wrongful dismissal claims and any other trade dispute that may arise. So this encouraged Newt to amend this constitution to include general workers, and that happened in 1992. Because a non-recognition of domestic workers, it has been a great challenge for the union going forward. Workers complain every day, and, and, and the, the complaint, the biggest complaint, is about this national insurance. So what we did, new members decided to form a service workers center cooperative society limited, 
with a view to addressing some of our challenges and to provide decent employment opportunities related services for domestic workers. And in 2020, 2014, we registered and launched our Service Workers Co-op with the support of the Iowa Caribbean Office. The, so the, the cooperative, what I, what I realize happens is while a domestic worker might be afraid you, you, you get a little job and you're free to tell the employer, well, I can't do this or I'm not doing that or whatever. Talk with the employer and make a contract because the law tells you that you know, before you hire domestic workers, you must give them a written contract, but that never happened. And how are we bringing that up? Because they are not considered as workers under the law. So that, all these things are challenges that domestic workers have to face for more than over two decades and we're still facing it. Now, we are, um, together with the ILO, we, we were able to hire a consultant, a developer consultant, they call her. She develops um, cooperatives. And a lot of cooperatives are now um, developed in the U.S. The domestic workers form their own cooperatives. So we said, let us um, do our own thing and see what will happen. But the, the thing is, workers don't have, they don't believe that we could be business people. You know, we, so, we get so accustomed depending on, on these um, people who hire us. But when the cooperative, I realized the workers were more assertive. They were able to deal with the employer in a different way. Because when they go, when if you want a domestic worker, you could call us in the service worker center co op. And but what we would have to do is to do a site visit first. Because we want to see how big your house is. We want to know what you want clean and what you don't want clean. So that we now could pre present now a contract for you. And then you will tell us, well, if you agree with it, yes or no, and then we will come now. And the domestic worker doing all that, eh? She go in and do all that. The site visit, she prepared, she had, well, she get help in the office with the contract, you know, and things like that. The agreement the employer makes. So it's about standing up to the employer because, you see, it is a kind of uneven power between you and the employer when you go there for work. You, you have so many children to mine, you have rent to pay. So you, 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 don't, you don't have that um, cloud to stand up to that employer. Because let me tell you, look what a worker told me. She said she's working for $3,200 a month. She works in a distribution um, department where they have this warehouse. Now they hire her to clean it, and she is cleaning. And now she's doing transfers because they say she has a little education, she knows to do things. And she is still getting the same two to two hundred dollars when she asks for a raise. The employer put on ten dollars, which was so insulting. And this worker came to me and said, I get two to two hundred dollars a month. Sixteen hundred dollars in rent, which is very little. Eh? $1,600 in rent. She has one child. She has to pay $800 to, for childcare because she has to go to work. And then she still has to pay light bill, water, and she has to eat food and not have transportation for that child to go in the care, to go to the caregiver place and, and she has to go to work. So this is the kind of situation women find herself in. And my dear, she said her husband, not her husband, but the child father was from Jamaica. And as soon as she got pregnant, he went back. So this is the kind of situation women in our country have to face. Now we got this woman to do a, a needs assessment with the organization, both organization, nude and the service workers. And the main findings of her report stated that on a legislative level, domestic workers have not been included in the Industrial Relations Act of Trinidad and Tobago. 
and therefore are not considered within the, in the formal sector. And that is why we did the call, so that we could formalize domestic work. But that and all is a big challenge. There are a number of repercussions to omitting domestic workers on a legislative level, she said, including a lack of institutional support to organize domestic workers into unions, not assuring them the rights that formal sector workers enjoy, and generally creating a loophole for employers to advantage their workers without recourse. Because you can't carry them in the ministry or labor or the industrial court if it has to do with wrongful dismissal. By the way, we have a minimum wages act, the household assistance order, which makes provision for sick leave, vacation leave, paid public, public holiday over time, but ask them how much of them are able to enjoy these things. Trinidad and Tobago has not ratified ILO Convention 189 concerning decent work for domestic workers. The government has signed a memorandum of understanding with the trade union movement to agree to a worker's agenda. The agenda includes the question of amending the IRA. The minister has held a, a, a first consultation to amend the IRA and we saw that it included domestic workers, but we don't know how far that will reach because the people on the end of whether they are trade unionists, whether they are labor, um, employer, nobody accountable to us. Because we're not hearing what's happening in that end task. Whether these trade unionists really working on our behalf. And that is what we need to know. And workers must start questioning trade unions who sit on boards and don't be accountable to the people. That is not no secret order. Now, the government has said that they're going to ratify, they're going to um, ratify our convention 189 after they amend the industrial relations act. Well, well, we don't know when that will happen, right? But we need to institutionalize the work of the registry because the Ministry of Labor brought out a domestic worker registry doing the same work that we ourselves trying to do, you know? And today we don't even know how much people register with our registry. The previous government, before they went out, they told me it's only 46. Well, I don't know if they must get 100 by now. So despite the fact that the IRA does not include domestic workers protected by the law, the National Insurance Board of Trinidad and Tobago formalizes the way in which it treats domestic workers. With its policy that states that if a worker gets compensated at least $180 per week, the employer is required to register the worker with the NIPTT within 14 days. During the focus group that the woman was here, a lot of members came out, she spoke to different people in the ministry, different trade unionists, to get a sense of what is really happening here in Trinidad and Tobago and what challenges the union face. During the focus group with new members, the consultant said that many participants shared that they have experienced multiple problems with employers refusing to pay into the national insurance system and employers deducting the contribution from the wages but not paying their contributions to the NIS and not registering them in the first place. Workers complain that the national insurance is not paid on their behalf. They are not registered in some instances, and when they inquire from the national insurance, they are fired, and they have no means of recourse under the labor legislation because they are not considered as workers under the Act. Denying them the right to benefit that other workers enjoy, like sickness benefit, injury benefit, all these other things domestic workers cannot enjoy that once they don't register the domestic and pay the national insurance. Now, according to the ILO, the provision of social protection 
is an effective and important means of reducing poverty and social exclusion as it prevents people from falling into poverty and enables the poor to escape the poverty trap. In the absence of social protection, people, especially the most vulnerable, are subjected to increased risk of sinking below the poverty line or remaining caught in conditions of poverty. Now, the national insurance, that is a tricky thing too, because a lot of workers come and complain that they went to the national insurance. And that national insurance will have you up and up, up and up, go by your doctor, go by the employer, do this, do that. Every time they give you a sheet on what the one done, when you go back, they ask, they might add on two or three more. So sometimes workers get frustrated and they don't bother with these benefits. Yes, sir, and recently a guy worked 23 years at a bakery, got sick, and when he went to the national insurance, the national insurance told him, well, you yeah, know, you have to go back and get a stamp from your employer, you know, on the application. Well, his parents had us re running up and down because he had cancer and he was on there, so the, the, it was an expense to when he had to go buy national insurance. I had to hire a vehicle to carry him there because national insurance would come out the door, come outside the building and see the man in the car and whatever. Right? But they have to put better things in place for us. All this money people pay into the national insurance and, and they must be more worker friendly. If you go and ask them for a contribution statement, they give you a contribution statement for the years. They will never tell you anything who pay for you. You never get the name of your employer. You will never get how much contribution you pay 2018 or 2017. That is a top secret. In order for you to get that, you have to go and get it in, um, with the information or app or something like that. The information at the phone. And yes. And that is the only reason you will get further information about the money you pay in the national insurance. Center. All right. So that, that work I was telling you about, you know what I'm doing? He dead and get a cent because the employer refused to put his stamp and the national insurance did nothing about it. So every time you go by the national insurance, it's always about you, not about the employer. A girl gets her finger cut off in a rima, in a, in a factory, a sweatshop she working in. The, um, the national insurance board is telling her she has to go and get um, what do you call it, um, an injury report, things that the girl don't even know what they're talking about. So she came to the union and I am trying to help her. But you see when you're poor, poor people don't get nothing easy in this country. So there's a lot of people remain without benefits despite the fact that they paid national insurance for years. So that is the situation right there. But I want to just, because I know my time going, but I want to tell you something about this union. We were invited to go to, to Geneva in 2016. The International Women's Action Rights Watch in Malaysia funded the union to go there because the Trinidad and Tobago government was being reviewed by CEDAW. CEDAW is the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And for years, we have been put in, into that shadow report that is made by the Netoka NGOs that domestic must be recognized as workers. So I got the opportunity to go before the committee people, the committee members in Geneva. I don't know how much time, two minutes at all. Not much thing I could say. But I got a lot of help from the woman, the women who were there, helping me to put everything in two minutes. I did my report to the committee. And what was nice because of my involvement with the international organization called the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Network. They invited me the year before 
and invited some of these committee members to come and sit with me so that I could ask them questions about the, the convention and the committee and they could be more informed on what I am doing here in Trinidad and Tobago. So that I was able to introduce me to human rights people from the Organization of Human Rights, the o OCHR. I can't remember all these acronyms. And the meaning of these acronyms, but OCHR. And I was able to go and speak to people, tell them don't get this domestic focus thing out of the agenda at all, because my government don't have no intention of recognizing domestic as workers. I was able to tell them all the different challenges domestic workers face, the exploitation that I had to go through. You know, working 30 years with people, and when they finish, they send you home, they never clear a center in a yes. You understand? There's a lot of wicked employers in Trinidad and the East. So that, and the committee there, we were able to report because it had another woman there from Trinidad and Tobago who gave all the issues concerning um, members of the network of NGOs about the marriage act and things like that. But the, the thing about it, the committee, the government didn't attend. They had a, a webinar in Trinidad and, and from there they, they asked them questions and most of the questions they couldn't answer. But it gave them some time to answer. And, and that is what we um, we monitor you now. What is the answers? Because they even give them time to answer on the app. When they're going and recognize domestic as workers under the industrial relations act, and they couldn't answer that. So that the committee, what happened at the end, the, the committee said that the CEO committee is concerned that all the workers are entitled to a minimum wage and the new minimum wage is order. They are not included within the definition of worker in the Industrial Relations Act. And the committee calls upon the state party, that is Trinidad and Tobago government, eh, to bring domestic workers within the definition of worker in the Industrial Relations Act. That is 2016, every now in 2018. You know? And the thing is, this 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 um this was when this was sent out in the late 2017, in 2018, the middle of 2018, eh? because they also told the government that the wide gender wage gap and persistent occupational segregation in the labor market, where women are often engaged in temporary work and the lack of all explicit and explicit provisions guarantee the principle of equal pay for work of equal value. Because you can see for yourself, we're doing the same work as the man in the, in the um, hotel cooking, but you know they're paying that man a lot of money. But you know, because you're cooking her, you're a woman, not because you're cooking. Because you're a woman, you will always get less. And that's how they treat women in this country and other places, not only here. I wouldn't put the blame on Trinidad alone. But we have to get rid of a patriarchy. You know, all these laws that they put here and chain us up. You know, we have to get rid of them. Because we have to take action. We can't be sitting down quiet anymore. I now come back from South Africa, and I'm not there with the shack dwellers. They are the people who have the ANC in power today. And these people are crying shame on the ANC, because these same shack dwellers who tried to get back the own land that was taken away from them years ago. What is happening? The very same government is setting people they are getting killed. We are lucky here, you know, in Trinidad and Tobago, you know, they haven't started to kill activists as yet. But what they do to us? They do us things in suffering. <laughs> so before I go into my uh, discussion, 
I just wanted to add one simple point to what uh, His Honor Mr. Russo was saying about the servant's pay being like a right. Well, um, there was a judge long ago, back in the 1950s, he was the master of the rules at the time in the UK courts. His name is Lord Denon. And he had explained in one of the judgments that servant's pay is a right. It's a proprietary right that you gain by the service that you render. So the more service you render, the more proprietary right that you have. And servant's pay comes about to compensate you for the loss of that right. It has nothing to do with providing for your period of unemployment, but it is to compensate you for the loss of that proprietary right that you gain in employment. So I just wanted to add that one piece to what uh, His Honor had said. Now, I am supposed to talk about um, pensions in the context of social security and my speaking time is I would like to go back a bit into our own history. 1937. Most of us believe that 1937 was about um, striking for increased wages. Well, this article in the Trinidad Guardian doesn't seem so. This is on June 30th, Trinidad Guardian. And what it says is that um, the meat that our great grandparents used to eat, well, it was called ox tongue. Anybody ever ate that before? Well, a pound of ox tongue was 72 cents, one pound. And at the top of the article, it says that um, the wages that we worked for was 56 cents a week. So back in those days, in 1937, we couldn't even buy one pound of meat. That is how bad it was for us. Real poverty, real, real catch us. Uh, the expression. But separate and apart from having to demand an improvement in our wages, there were quite a number of other things that we were demanding, and I'll just identify some of them for you. At that time in 1937, we were citizens of the British Empire, we were a colony of Britain. And some of the things that Butler had said, it's listed here. The citizens of Britain, when their children can't afford to go to school, you pay for them, you give them free education, you give them free books, uniform, and free school meals. But our children can't go, so we want that too. Good for one. Good for all. And we got that out of 1937. It was introduced in 1939. No government didn't give us that. We fought for that. And we won that. But that was all. We fought for the right to get assistance with housing because it was about 12 families to one barrack house and one outhouse for the 12 families to use and we got improvement in housing conditions. But central to our discussion this afternoon is the fact that we fought for what was called old age pension. That was not given to anybody at the time in Trinidad and Tobago. But the citizens of Britain, when they retired, as far back as 1909, they would get social security pension. We didn't get it. So we had to fight for that. And it wasn't until 1939 that the legislation was introduced for the first time to give us social security pension. That's how it came in the Trinidad. So it's not a, a handout. It's not that some benevolent government named PNM or UNC or whatever gave us that. 
we fought for that. They came and they met that here. And of course, they've improved it over the years. But the central point is that we fought for it. We didn't get it just like that. Now, it developed into occupational pensions between employers and unions, and that happened as trade unions in Britain began to fight with employers to introduce occupational pensions. So when they were introduced and we got rid of it, we adopted that approach and also got the employers to introduce occupational pensions. Today, occupational pensions, we have about a little over 100 from the records of the Central Bank Data Center. About 100 pension plans in existence. And believe you me, the assets of those pension plans is over 50 billion dollars. That's the amount of money that the workers are supposed to be in control of. But we don't actually control it, most of us. Why? Because the management committees are not functional. The employers put who they want to represent workers on the management committee. They decide the workers' representatives, you know. And we have to change that. We have to be able to take charge of what is by right our deferred earnings. This is the definition of occupational pensions. It's a deferred earning. You earn that part of the salary that the employer contributes, 5% or 10%, but the month in which you earn it, you don't receive it. It is deferred, the payment of that is deferred until you reach age 60. So it is your deferred earnings. And if a pension is a deferred earning, then it's mine. It's not a, the property of the employer. So he should exercise the kind of control that he exercises in pension plans today. Determining what to invest, determining what the benefit should be and what it should be. So I want to raise some of the important issues in pensions that you need to look at. First of all, let me focus on the government dedicated workers in central and local government who after all these years continue to be without a pension plan. And that is because the government has been able to wind its way out of the negotiations by skillfully introducing non-starters. I remember when Brian Quaito was the Minister of Finance and Selwyn John was President General, he said to the NUGFW then, okay, we'll introduce a pension plan. So it was agreed to give the workers a pension. What did he do? Very innovative idea, so he said, that what we will do is introduce a defined contribution plan. Or they put me in charge of the negotiations. So I went to the trust and asked the trust, what will the workers enjoy when they retire under this defined contribution plan? It is basically the workers will put in their contribution, the employer will match it, and at the end of the day, whatever interest is accrued, it accrues, you'll buy a pension of that. Unitra said, well, based on the data that we have in front of us, you all will get a, approximately $100 less than old age pension. There was no way that the union could agree with that proposal. Because why contribute a plan and you're going to get less than old age, which he was getting free at the time, without having to contribute. The next proposal came with Ken Valley. Valley says, all right, we will introduce a pension plan for the elevated workers. However, there's one condition. It must be harmonized with national insurance. There was a, um, let me see what we can use for that word. A little cross 
<laughs> between myself and the minister. We had a, 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 a fairly exchange, a um, heated up exchange on that because had the union that accepted that proposal, that would have matched the union. The workers would have lost tremendously. One of the conditions was that they would have to give up the vaccine list. And on average, that would have been about fifty, sixty thousand dollars in vaccine list that they wanted us to give up. On top of that, the pension would have been reduced by the amount that NIS would have paid them, so they were going to lose on the second limb. And there was no way that the union could have agreed to those for themselves. Well, the truth of the matter is that all the attempts that the government have made to introduce pension plans have been fought with a number of difficulties and traps. And on this occasion, my advice to the NUGNW is to do what we did in the past. If we want to get a pension plan in place, well, if we can't convince them by the power of our arguments, let's convince them by the arguments of our power. We are more than 20,000 strong. So that is the way forward for that I would advise NUGNW. Second one, I want to take a look at PSA. I don't intend to marshal anybody's courts, but if it does, my apologies. The PSA's pension has not been, well, it has been around for quite some time. It's non contributory. But the reality is that there has not been any significant attempt to improve that pension for quite some time. The minimum pension for public servants stands at $3,000 a month. And old age pension is above that. PSA has to do some good to get both the accrual rate for calculated pensions and the lump sum conversion factor for calculated lump sums improved. Their current position stands at um, $12.50 for every $1 to convert 25% of your pension into a lump sum. Well, a number of plants have gone past that here. Plants today are paying $15, $16, $17 on every dollar. So PSA should sit down and make a thorough study with some serious proposals to improve the pensions of the public servants. They need to do that. They haven't done it for quite some time. The next one I want to uh, come on. Use of the simplest. One of the major disputes between employers and unions is who owns the surplus and who should come through it. Well, the employer believes. He sponsored the plan, so he has right it. And very often, what we have seen happen is that the employers will take control of the surplus and say, "Well, we're going to use that surplus for a contribution holiday." So rather than pay contributions into the plan, the surplus will finance the contributions, and the workers will have to pay any contributions because the surplus will also finance their contributions. At the end of the day, when people retire and they see the very small sums that they go home with, then the union has the problem of trying to address that. Why? Because the surplus will not used to improve the benefits. My advice to you is to look at all the pension plans now, see where they are in surplus and make proposals for, for improving your pension benefits. There are a number of ways in which we can do that. First of all, we look at the accrual rates. Most of the accrual rates in pensions today stand at 2% for each year of service. But a number of pensions
intervention plans because of negotiations with the union, their inter intervention, they have gone beyond 1% of final salary. They are using 2.5%, which gives you a faster rate of accruing a full pension of two-thirds. The second um, proposition that you can look at in terms of the improvements is your lump sum conversion factor, which I spoke of earlier. The third area that you can look at is what other benefits can we get from our pension plan separate and apart from or in addition to a monthly pension. Well, the Tech workers were very creative back in the 1990s and that came about because the OW team where I wrote at that time together with his own Mr. Rousseau and uh, we were led at that time by Sylvester Ramqua, who has since died. We developed the concept of the social wage and in TNTEC, we had called on TNTEC to set aside 10% of the pension plan for employee mortgage schemes, mortgage loans. Every private citizen could go to the public bank, access our pension funds, and build a house. So why can't we access our own pensions and build our homes? And of course, at a reduced rate, the going rate then was about 25%. We brought it down to about 3 to 4 percent as the interest rate on the loan. And of course, some of the associated fees, like legal fees and so on, were part and parcel of the loan. The, the mortgage plan was also used to not just build the home, but also to do renovation, repairs, and acquisitions of housing. So that is one way in which you can look at the future use of your pension funds. That has been done at uh, NB and Petrotrim as well. Another use at WASA, we all have to die. None of us will leave here alive. Um, the comrades at WASA have developed a proposal to introduce a funeral grant of six months pension, in addition to the monthly pension, it wouldn't come from that, but the plan would be a funeral grant of six months pension, so that when the worker dies, the family does not have to go here, then everywhere to find out how are we going to bury this person. The pension plan would fund a substantial part of the funeral cost. So those are two ways that you can look at. Of course, there are more. Just tap your creative minds and you develop more ways in which you can use your pension. There's a topical issue that I want to briefly touch on. The increase in the retirement age. I may step on some points, but that is not intentional. First Citizens Bank has introduced a proposal to increase the retirement age to 65. Well, when we examine the proposal, the first thing is that the increase in retirement age to 65 will not be applicable to everybody. It will be applicable only to those who they choose to keep on after age 60. And you know, the vast majority of the workers are the world ranks in the job ladder. So they are not going to be kept on. So they will benefit. The second thing is that the proposal comprised another component where new entrants would have access to a different arrangement for pension because the formula will be changed. When we looked at the change in the formula, it is less than what currently exists. So to increase the retirement age to 65 means to put the new workers at a disadvantage of receiving a reduced pension. The third one was that the existing pension arrangement, it would 
result in a reduction in total income to the worker in that one, if he retires at age 65, he will be accessing the full pension. If he retires from age 60, he's going to get a reduced pension. If he retires at age 61, he's going to get a reduction in the full pension, 62, and so on, goes straight up to 64. And only at age 65, he will qualify for an unreduced full pension. So he's going to lose. So the, the, the uh, proposal from First Citizens Bank for increasing the retirement age to age 65 was rejected. I suspect that quite a number of other employers are going to begin raising the question of increasing the retirement age. My own view, and I will be happy to engage anybody in that, is that the increase in the retirement age is really just another scheme to reduce the pension benefits that would have accrued to workers. That is basically what it would amount to. And I say that because of the fact that rather than receive your pension at age 16, if you calculate the amount that you would have received between age 16 to 65, you would see the loss that you would have incurred. Because not everybody is going to be brought back on contract after age 60. And that is essentially what the National Insurance Board has proposed right now in their proposal for increasing the retirement age. What they have said is that the system is facing a number of problems and as a result of that one of the solutions is to increase the retirement age. But if you look at the schedule of benefits that is being proposed Right now, those between classes 13 to 16, let us say that they are entitled to pension X. If they retire at age 16, the pension that they, get, that they will get is pension X minus 1, a reduction in the pension. They go straight up to age 64, the pension will continue to be reduced. And the only time you get a full amount that you are currently and lawfully entitled to now is at age 65. So what you are lawfully entitled to today at age 60, you won't get that until age 65. Any retirement between those five year periods is a reduction. Well, reducing people's benefits was never the way the trade unions believed was a solution to the problem. The problem is one of funding and the employers are simply refusing to increase the funding that is required to keep NIB where it ought to be in order to pay the required benefits. That is why I see harmonization that is going to come up very, very soon on a number of pension plans. In fact, it was raised in one of the television programs last week in a debate between Mariano Brown and Jacqueline Pomino, who now heads the National Insurance Board, essentially what they are seeking to do is to reduce the liability of the employers by harmonizing occupational pensions with national insurance. One of the activities, well known activities today, the Coach and Sousa, they found that the NIS pension is too generous. $3,000 a month minimum, that's in their view too generous, it should be paid, it should be less. And they made a written proposal, that's in their pension use, that what the employers can do is factor in that into their course to see whether or not they can reconfigure the occupation and pension because of the amount of money that NIS is now paying. So what Mayor Mojang Sousa is proposing is a reduction in occupational pensions. And that is going to be a real big fight coming. I advise you to be afraid. Thank you very much.